Before we start, I'd really like to invite everybody to do one small thing. Um, so the invitation is, is to either write in the chat box or on a piece of paper if you would rather it was private, uh, one thing that you hope for. Now that could be for yourself, that's absolutely fine, a hope for yourself, a hope for your family, a hope for the world, and that can be as large or as small a hope as you like. You can be as ambitious as you like, you can be as small a hope as you like. And um, we'll come back to those later. So do feel free to um, to put those in the chat box if you'd like to, or as I said, if you prefer, just to write it on a piece of paper and we'll come back to those later. Now, first of all, I just wanted to talk about uh, my definition of hope. And when I started writing my book and thinking and talking to people about hope, it occurred to me that it's really important for me to define what I meant by hope. And so what I'm talking about and discussing is what Joanne Macy refers to as active hope. Now, my definition of hope is not the same as optimism, which I think is the belief that everything will go right, or pessimism, which is the belief that everything will go wrong. But hope for me is active, and it's the belief in the possibility that things could change for the better if we take action. So that's my definition, and that's the kind of hope I'm talking about. Um, it is one of those words that might be useful for you to think about what that means for you and how you might define that for yourself too. The book covers a lot of subjects and it contains lots and lots of stories, myths and fables, as well as news stories and real life stories of triumph over adversity. All of them are hopeful stories. So as a storyteller and a story hunter, I believe right now, as a matter of great urgency, we need these different kinds of story. So that our science fiction isn't exclusively dystopian, so that our news isn't only bad news, so that we hear and learn about innovation and solutions, as well as disasters and catastrophes, and stories of kindness too, so that we can fall back in love with the world and with our fellow humans. And when you love something, you will fight to protect and defend it. And we really need that right now. We need to love the world and to love each other. So since 2011, as some of you might know, I've been fortunate enough to tour this country and the US talking about the life-changing effects of practicing kindness, as I'd experienced firsthand in my project, 366 Days of Kindness, which was a wild experiment in which I tried to do a kind thing for a stranger every single day for a leap year to see if kindness could change the world. And during this time, I worked with and met many teachers, educators, artists, activists, and all kinds of amazing people on my journey. And my life began to fill with wonder and hope instead of despair. And I discovered that, that kindness can indeed change the world. So let's fast forward over that to March 2018. I've been practicing kindness for a number of years by now. And I'm on the number 47 bus towards Lewisham. I don't know if any of you have ever got the 47 bus towards Lewisham, but like all buses, it's a great place for eavesdropping on conversations. To tell you I was a story hunter, buses are fertile grounds for that sort of territory. And I overheard a woman say to her friend that the news that morning had made her cry, that she felt hopeless that she didn't see the point of anything. And after that, I noticed how many of my friends and my colleagues were expressing the very same thing. And I kept thinking about hope, what it meant and how much I needed it as the fuel to keep me going. And then I thought about how dangerous it seemed that if we all gave into despair, then surely no one would do anything, would they, or try anything. And then wouldn't the things that were bad just get worse? So pretty much straight away, I embarked upon another journey, more story hunting, to find hope and to talk to people from all kinds of backgrounds about how they find hope and how it helped them. I talked to firefighters in the midst of dealing with the Blue Mountains bushfires in Australia. I spoke with a 10-year-old climate justice activist and to a man living with terminal cancer who decided in his last days to climb Mount Everest. I discovered innovations from around the world, 
which opened my eyes to the fact of whatever the problem is, there is always, always someone trying or seeking to solve that problem. So I just wanted to share with you, <laughs> I'm laughing because my very nice colleague is creeping around to take a picture of me whilst I do this. Um, I just wanted to share with you a few ideas about hope. So I've decided today to focus on the news, just to let you know my book covers many different topics, but I'm going to focus on the news today. The news being one of the very important ways that we receive stories about each other and about the world. And as I found out during the time I was researching, the way we receive these stories, what kind of stories, the message of those stories and who tells them, is one of the ways that our hope can be eroded, but also one of the ways that our hope can be restored. So this is an extract from my book, well, a sort of adaptation of an extract from my book from chapter six, which is called The Edge Lens. I conducted a straw poll amongst my friends and contacts by posting this question on Facebook. So I was just wondering, do any of you avoid watching the news? Overwhelmingly, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the answer was, yeah. Most of my friends and contacts were avoiding the news. The reasons weren't surprising, but included, it's too depressing, I avoid it for my own sanity, it's dumbed down, it's way too scary, it's biased, it's full of lies, there's too much hate and rage. Maybe those are things you'd expect to hear from people, but most upsetting for me was a message from a good friend of mine called Karen Dawson. And she said this, after Christmas, the lunchtime news on my favorite radio station led on a particularly heartbreaking, tragic story. One of those you can do nothing about, but you can't stop thinking about for days, sandwiched between jolly alternative Christmas songs. And I struggle to stay level most of the time. And something like that is all it takes to knock me down for the rest of the day. And it's got to the point where I've stopped listening to the radio together. Altogether. I've just run out of resilience. You see, I believe that a lot of us are switching off from the news, like Karen, just because it's making us miserable. And um, why would we want to be miserable, right? Often the message it delivers is so hopeless that we feel utterly powerless to change anything about the situations on our screens. And is it any wonder? Our daily, hourly, minute by minute updates seem to be filled with terrible stories. An aerial shot of a forest on fire in the Blue Mountains National Park in Australia, burnt koalas crawling through blackened tree stumps, an overcrowded dinghy full of desperate, worried people in the Mediterranean, a park full of tents sheltering homeless people in Brighton, England, a camp in Calais, France, full of tents and children playing with sticks. A turtle found in Missouri, USA, caught in a plastic six-pack ring and unable to escape. The shanty towns in Marsh Harbor in the Bahamas reduced to matchsticks by Hurricane Dorian. And a woman cradled in dust, cradling a baby in a bombed out house in Duma, Syria, people running, a city reduced to ash. And in the face of all this, I can see how tempting it might be to disengage from the news altogether, to avert our eyes and to protect ourselves from the feeling of misery and powerlessness that this barrage of sadness and tragedy creates. But perhaps removing ourselves completely from what our fellow humans and the natural world is experiencing isn't the best way to deal with it either. So how do we keep our hope alive in the face of all of this? Amongst the responses to my Facebook post that day, almost buried by the outpourings of fear, despair, frustration, boredom and mistrust, there was a reply that really pinged out from my friend Flick. And she said, I read and I listen to the news all the time. It's important to be informed. Otherwise we end up in situations like we are now. It doesn't need to make you miserable. In fact, it can be incredibly empowering to see where one is in the world and what needs to be done to encourage others to join in with positive action. And I agree. Shutting the door and all the sad and bad things out there is unhelpful because simply ignoring problems doesn't make them go away. And some of them are so enormous, such as the effects of climate change, 
that there is little doubt that they will be impacting on each of our lives soon. And I believe that it's better to face these challenges with courage and to find ways to help make things better where and when we are able. But I also know that not everyone feels motivated to take positive action whilst being constantly surrounded by terrible news because it's frightening and fear can immobilize us. So science tells us that we are hardwired to respond to fear and that this response evolved as a survival mechanism, enabling people and other mammals to react quickly to life-threatening situations, the flight, fight or freeze. According to psychotherapist Suzanne Babel, constant exposure to fear and trauma puts us into stress mode with a continuous release of stress hormones like cortisol and adrenaline. Suzanne explains how this can lead to adrenal fatigue, which in turn can lead to being tired in the morning, lack of restful sleep, anxiety and depression, as well as a multitude of other symptoms. In other words, too much bad news can make us ill. And being in this state is no good for us or for anyone else. So it seems to me that we need to find a way to engage with the news, to gain useful and important information about the world that we all live in, but on a level that doesn't overwhelm us and feeds into a cycle of pessimism and despair that can feel completely paralyzing. We need to rebalance our media diet so that it becomes more hope and solutions focused whilst keeping an eye on the headlines so that we're able to use the news as a source of strength and of ideas for positive actions. And I hope that I can help reach a compromise between ignoring the news completely and obsessing over it. I'd like us all to find a place between despair claiming that the end is nigh and therefore everything is pointless and denial where we sit eating ice cream in a meadow, ignoring the forest fire raging behind us, where creative responses can grow and flourish. And I call this place the Edgelands. In the Edgelands, there is a safe, fertile space where the wild flowers of hope can grow and it's quiet here. It's a little bit neglected and it can be a bit uncomfortable sitting between those two extremes. But here in the Edgelands, the first shoots of possibility spring up like daisies popping up in the cracks of the pavement. Here there is space for creativity and for dreaming, for action and for learning and for keeping each other company and for encouragement. First of all, it's important to remember that although there are always terrible things going on in the world, on any given day, there are always positive news stories too. One of the issues with finding them is that mainstream media outlets often focus on more negative news, in part because there has been a belief, sometimes backed up by higher numbers of clicks and shares, that these are the stories people are drawn toward. Yet these stories are not the only reality. There's a story of the town of Narbuth in Wales welcoming refugee families into their community with open arms and kindness. There's the story of the remote village of Shikapur in Bangladesh using solar panels to create and share their own power and gaining independence. There's a story of an isolated older lady in Plymouth in England receiving over 600 birthday cards after her story of loneliness was shared online. And that's just a few. And positive stories are often not front page news in the mainstream media, but coming across one of them can sometimes be just what we need to help lift our hope. During the coronavirus pandemic, which we've all lived through, there was a massive increase in people seeking out hopeful, positive news. 
In March 2020, the actor John Kaczynski brought out a news network for Good News on YouTube. And within one week, Some Good News had more than 1.5 million subscribers and 25 million views. Google searches for Good News spiked in April 2020 and they continue to rise. A constant stream of negative news is no longer serving us. Far from ensuring our survival, it is threatening it by producing fear and inaction in people, as well as making some of us deeply and profoundly miserable. So good news can be really beneficial in giving us a break from the onslaught, onslaught. Yet we can't solely focus on these stories because, of course, a good news story in one place doesn't negate the damage done in another and all the pain that that can make us feel. However, there are different types of positive news. There are the plain and simple stories of the wonderful things happening in the world. For example, the story of a group of teenage boys delivering care packages to isolated older people in their town. And there are stories about enormous problems and challenges that also offer up possible solutions. For example, the news that honeybees are in steep decline but with ideas of how to help them by choosing what we plant in our gardens carefully and information about organisations worldwide who are addressing this issue constructively. These stories, in part, become ones of creativity, innovation and invention that encourage us all to act. And it seems this approach of positive news has merit. So the positive psychology researcher, Jody Jackson, conducted a study at the University of East London on the effects of consuming constructive journalism. Her research found that on an individual level, news stories that focused on solutions were shown to boost a person's belief in their ability to make a difference. And the study also found that these news stories led to an increase in optimism, encouraged people to tackle a problem rather than avoid it, and inspired them to take part in their community and to try to make a difference. These are all very persuasive reasons for changing how we consume the news. This solutions-driven journalism, which encouraged a more hope-fueled media landscape, is something that news presenter Martin Lewis has been promoting since 1993. I first heard Martin speak when I was invited to an event hosted by my friends at Action for Happiness, which was right here in Conway Hall back in 2015. And it's no exaggeration to say that this single evening changed forever the way that I engage with the news. And Martin's talk helped me to recover hope when it was waning. That night he said, the main criteria for commissioning stories should not be the degree of violence, death, conflict, failure or disaster that they encompass but the extent to which these stories shape or change or have the potential to shape or change the country or the world in which we live so that people are kept fully aware of the changes which offer hope, even when, at first glance, the main issue might be a negative one. In his talk, Martin spoke about, whilst he understands why so many journalists focus on the stories of young people being rioters, vandals, muggers or looters, he doesn't understand why there is no parallel reporting of young people serving their communities in positive ways. And that night he cited a beautiful example of the young people who set up a community radio station in North Lambeth with local police reporting that since they went on air, youth crime has stopped completely. Yep, you heard me right. Youth crime stopped completely. Yet, as he said that evening, not a single national media journalist thought that worth reporting. Since Martin Lewis's initial appeal for reconsidering the way news is presented, things have begun to transform for the better. There are an increase increasing number of constructive and solutions driven stories coming from the established media such as the New York Times, The Guardian's Upside section and BBC World Hacks, but also from the many, many websites such as the Good News Network, Reasons to be Cheerful and journalist Becky Barnes newsletter to Uplift, 
There's also Kickstarter funded publications such as the beautifully illustrated The Happy Newspaper. And last but not least, the wonderful positive news. And this is a move in the right direction, but there is of course more work to be done. If you're worried whilst you're listening that by focusing more strongly on positive news, that I'm being blithely and naively optimistic about the harsh reality of the world, then I say this to you. The true reality of the world is complex and includes both good and bad challenges and opportunities. And at the very least, reading positive news and solutions focused stories will have a beneficial effect on your mental health. And instead of flooding your system with anxiety inducing cortisol, with only a narrow view of what's going on in the world, you will allow yourself to see a truer, fuller reflection. But even better, when you allow yourself to read these stories of people being creative, innovative and proactive, you might even join them or support them and help to change the world. We can choose to be part of the changes in our world in a positive way by hoping and believing that things can and do get better and by taking action. I just wanted to tell you one story of a, a small example of a news story that, that changed somebody's life. Um, so back in 2019, a friend of mine called Libby read an article on social media on Facebook about a community store based in a scout hut in Scotland, which enabled local residents on low incomes to collect good quality surplus supermarket food. And all it cost the residents was a small, very, very affordable monthly membership fee. Recognising that this was something very much needed in her local community in South London, Libby set up and created a similar project herself. She founded a website dedicated to helping people do just this, and she secured help from her local authority and residents, partnered with a food charity and liaised with nearby businesses and shops. Within a few months, they had enough volunteers to open their door. And by 2020, they had 40 members. And Libby said to me, if I had not read that story, I might not have had the confidence to try it myself. It was good to see how other people had done it and see that it was possible to make a real difference to your community. So you see, reading just that one positive news story gave Libby the hope that she had the power to make a difference and moved her to take action of her own. In many ways, we live in a time of great wonders. Those of us lucky enough to have smartphones are carrying around in our back pockets a device which can access much of the knowledge of humanity. And given its enormous potential, it seems a shame to waste it on arguing with strangers over politics or reading anger-filled comments threads that keep us up at night worrying. Let's use all of those tools at our disposal for good instead as part of an ecosystem of hope. So please do chat to your neighbours, friends, parents and children about the stories you've discovered whilst exploring constructive journalism. Enjoy the telling and notice how people respond. Share those positive actions on social media and get their message out there. You don't know who might be inspired by them. And at the very least, you'll be helping to break the endless feedback loop of negativity, anxiety and fear that we so often find ourselves reacting and contributing through our interactions on social media. And instead, you'll be spreading a bit more hope across the world. By exploring a different approach to experiencing the news, we can use it as a source of hope and a call to action. We can consider those stories and say to ourselves, that thing that floored you, that shook your resilience, that made you feel such pain or such fear, here is something that you can do that helps, that changes that picture, that changes that story, that creates hope. Hope is not the same as denial, nor does it require denial, but it does need protecting and nurturing. And by reassessing how we engage with the news, we can find ways to stay informed without giving in to despair. We can find a way to settle into those edge lands 
to imagine how else things might be. And then alongside those who sit with us to act with hope, creating hope, helping change happen. And now <laughs> some of you might realize that the hardback of, of my book actually came out um, in September, 2020. So I finished writing my book about hope Sorry? Oh, thank you very much. Yes, very good point. My dear colleague told me to hold it up. There it is. <laughs> That's my book. Um, yeah, so I finished it about a week before lockdown. So I was like, woohoo! I'd kind of gone into my own private lockdown in order to write it, popped my head up, and then, yes, we had the global pandemic. And I had a really interesting conversation with my uh, publishers because, of course, a global pandemic is not something that you choose to or want to ignore when you're writing a book about hope. And it was an interesting process, um, adding bits to the book, book uh, accommodating it. And one of the most interesting things in the way was how little it changed, not how much it changed. Um, so a lot of people in, in the last year have very kindly asked me if COVID changed my ideas about hope. And the, and the truthful answer is no. The truthful answer is that the pandemic confirmed my ideas about hope, tested them and proved them right. Because during these strange and difficult days in front of all of our eyes, we saw what really matters. We felt what really gives our lives meaning. And despite the very real troubles of the world, and the stories that we are told about each other, that humans are bad, selfish, not to be trusted. The truth is that we witnessed is that we yearn to help each other and we yearn to connect. Just see how many volunteered for the NHS, how many donated to food banks, how many set up neighborhood WhatsApp groups, how many took care of their neighbors, how many filled their windows with beautiful images and words, and how many of us, when passing in that strange COVID waltz that we had to do when we were keeping far apart when we were outside, just said, how are you? And waited with interest for the answer. How are you? And waited with interest for the answer. It also confirmed to me that when we fear scarcity, that there might not be enough toilet rolls or pasta or money or medicine, we panic and we behave badly. And of course we do, of course we do. But it's those mostly groundless, pointless, useless fears that we need to confront and comfort and reassure those who are scared instead of judging them to forgive ourselves and each other for what we did when we were just trying to survive. Hold on to the points of light, and there were many. There were so many stories of hope and kindness, and 2020 was full of them, and 2021 so far, I think. Hope grew for many of us during this strange time as we saw how we can take care of and stick up for each other, even in the darkest of days. The killing of George Floyd, the disruption and violence during the US election process, the killing of Sarah Everett. Even in these terrible days, we witnessed peaceful protests. We saw unity, solidarity, calls and petition for change. We witnessed reflection profound growth, learning, and difficult private and public conversations about justice and equality rise up. Uncertainty is something that we have all had to learn to live with. And yes, our future is uncertain still now, but that does contain the possibility that it could be wonderful. And there lies hope. Thank you. Um, thank you. So I just uh, wanted to go back to, oh, I just wondered if anyone had had a chance to think about um, anything that they might hope for themselves, uh, or their community, or, or the world. And as I said, you're really welcome to put it up in the chat box, and also very welcome to just uh, privately have that in your, in your mind. I'll just see if there's one. Oh. Uh, yeah, I think this is a really good point. So somebody's written, I think I find hope by drawing a line from where I am now to the future I want to be in. 
and, and think about how I get from one to the other. So my challenge is, is even if you, you haven't shared that in the chat box, which is absolutely fine, and if you're thinking of that privately, is to have a little think about what's a very small action that you might be able to take in the next 24 hours to get yourself towards that hopeful future. And I mention this because sometimes when we hear about the overwhelming challenges of the world, we can just think to ourselves, well, there's nothing that I can do. That it's so enormous. What can I do to make any difference? And this puts me in mind of a really beautiful story that my friend who's a vicar, Pete Sainsbury, told me um, right back in 2012 when I was at the middle of my acts of kindness journey. And you'll have heard this story and I'm going to tell it as, as Pete told me. So one day, um, there was a little girl, she's walking along a beach, beautiful beach, it's sunny day, it's gorgeous. And there was a man uh, walking along the beach uh, in the opposite direction to her, so they're walking towards each other. And the man noticed that the beach was absolutely filled uh, with starfish, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of starfish had washed up onto the beach. And he also noticed that the little girl was occasionally bending down, picking up one of the starfish and throwing it back into the water. And he watched her do this a few times and he thought, yeah, that's kind of really cute. That's a really kind of cute kiddie thing to do, but um, not sure, uh, not sure that what she's doing is really doing much good. They got closer together. She'd carry on occasionally throwing the starfish back into the water and he'd carried on watching her. And when he got close enough to be able to speak to her face to face, they stood opposite each other. And he said, um, yeah, I've been watching you. Like, I, I saw what you were doing. You're like uh, throwing the star, picking the starfish up and throwing them back into the water. And that's, that's really nice. Um, it's really nice, but I'm not, I'm not sure, you know, there's hundreds of thousands of starfish on this beach. And I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're doing is making much of a difference. And the little girl sort of crossed her arms, looked up at the man, kind of gave him a look as if to say, you silly, stupid man. <laughs> and she bent down, picked up a starfish, threw it into the water and said to him, well, it made a difference to that one. And uh, I just really like that story because it reminds me that actually we can all pick up one starfish from the beach, which is crowded with hundreds of thousands of stranded starfish and make a difference to that one. And we can all take one small action for ourselves, for our communities, for our families, all for the world, which will hopefully um, push us in the right direction. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I think we've got some time now for some Q and A. That's okay. If any, if anybody has any questions for our attendees here, um, do remember that you can ask questions, of Bernadette. For technical reasons today, I'm going to have to ask them on your behalf. Normally, I would try to unmute you so that you could ask them directly. But just on this occasion, just type it in, and I'll ask on your behalf. But I'm going to go first. Um, because there was something that struck me. I seem to remember from psychology, from my psychology days, that uh, when people suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, that you can have two categories of people who are in the same situation, in effect. You can have the people who have been buried under the rubble in the earthquake, and you can have the firefighters or rescuers who come in and collect them. And there's a lot of hazard for both categories of person. Um, and the the situation is as random and dangerous for both categories of person, but you get less PTSD yes. among the rescuers yes. than by, than by the, in the people who have been captured. And, and it's thought that it's because they have a bit of agency. I think it takes courage to sort of sit in the moment we're in and say, the best I can do and the best I can hope for is enjoy the moment that I'm in and, and perhaps make plans to have something to look forward to tomorrow. I'm not suggesting for a moment that accepting uncertainty is easy. It isn't. But I think fighting it and trying to reach or gain certainty when at the moment that doesn't look possible, possibly is more damaging in terms of our mental health and our peace of mind. Um, 
And there are some things that we are able to control. And I think that can give us back a bit of certainty. So we are able to have agency over keeping ourselves healthy by what we eat, by making sure we exercise if we're able to do that, uh, by um, thinking about what we consume. The, the, we are what we eat ways and always. So thinking about what you eat, what you watch, what you're reading that comforts you or entertains you or gives you solace or hope, whatever it is you need. And so you can be certain in yourself, I think. It's really important to remember we can depend on ourselves. We can depend upon ourselves to look after ourselves, to be kind to ourselves and to be kind to the immediate people around us. So at the moment, it feels like the only certainty we can be sure of it is right here with ourselves. I um, researched a lot the work of Dr. Rick, Rick Hansen, actually, and he does some really interesting stuff um, about our, our negativity bias. Mm -hmm. And I found this really helpful in connecting with what you were saying about pessimism. And that once I understood through studying his work that, I, that I've written about in the book, once I understood that actually the reason we tend towards expecting the worst, it sort of serves our survival mechanism. You know, for example, um, I tell this story in the book about a, a woman. Uh, in in, in uh, prehistoric times who goes out with her friend to pick berries and have a beautiful day. They see a rainbow, they see a sparkling stream, they collect some really beautiful mushrooms and berries. But on the way back, she trips on a, um, a tree root. And when she gets back to her, her the group that she's living with, she tells them about the tree root. She doesn't tell about the berries or the rainbow or the sparkling stream because it's the tree root that the next people that go out should avoid because it could get them into trouble and hurt them. So our negative, negativity bias, our pessimism, if you like, comes from us wanting to survive and help ourselves. So we have to work quite hard at remembering and focusing on the positive bit of the story, the rainbow, the sparkling stream, the berries. And Dr. Rick Hansen's work's really interesting about this. He speaks a lot about how literally lingering on it for a moment, saying, when I got on the bus today, that, that the bus driver was really jolly and friendly. And let yourself sit with that positive experience so it has a chance to transfer to your memory. So we do have a way of sort of training our brains um, away from pessimism and, ne and negativity bias into a sort of more positive way of, uh, of seeing the world, at least acknowledging that both of those things exist. You can, both tri you can trip in a tree root and have a nice bowl of berries. <laughs> well, it's worth remembering we do create our reality, isn't it? And I think that's part of what you're saying. We yeah. Positive acts of kindness is it helps you to think about positive things. It's a very thank you for saying that. We do create our reality, and I think it's a very empowering thing for me. Sort of connects with um, certainty as well. Um, you, you, we have each of us have the choice to decide how we see the world. That is your power. You have that power. And when I started first doing acts of kindness back in. 2011, one of the most extraordinary life-changing things for me was not the fact that I was doing acts of kindness, but that by focusing on it, I started to notice it. Now, I wasn't noticing things that didn't exist. I wasn't seeing sort of, you know, ghosts and fairies. I was seeing kindnesses done in the world because I'd decided to focus on it. I was seeing a different version of the world to the one that I'd seen before. I just didn't notice those things. So if you choose, if you give yourself permission, if you allow yourself to see beauty, to notice beauty, to notice kindness, to notice wonder, to see the amazing innovations and technologies and innovations and inventions that are in the world, if you allow yourself to choose and notice those things, you can literally change your reality. But it doesn't make it not true. And it doesn't just change your reality, it changes the reality of the world in general because you're more resourceful and able to do something, you're able to, to put back into the system. Absolutely, yes. Bernadette, that's the most incredibly positive moment for us to finish, really. It's, um, it's very sort of uplifting, the thought that we can actually do something, even though we're all just small people, we're not millionaires, we're not politicians yeah. or anything. Um, I'd just like to remind everybody that Bernadette's book is out. And I would also like to thank Jeff Davey, Scott Wood and Joe Atari for their um, organising everything and for technically running everything today. 
Conway Hall Ethical Society has suffered as much as everybody has in the last year or so. So if you haven't suffered financially, we would be very grateful for a donation. It goes to a really good cause. We do fantastic work work here. I hope you enjoyed today. Um, I certainly enjoyed speaking to Bernadette Russell. Thank you very much for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you.